Good evening from Yami B TV. Wishing you all well today. Sending loads of love as usual. Um, Robert Simmons, hold on tight a minute, please, sir. Uh, trace the face. Sending loads of love to you, baby. Missing you loads at the moment. Hope to see you soon. Uh, Auntie P, uh, AG, Ricky Ed. Uh, Emma, Emma Redman, nice to have you back as well, old Emma. I missed you for ages. It's or it's funny when you uh, you people go missing for yonks and yonks and yonks. And special love going out to Gang Gang as well. And Nita down near Manchester. I've missed you quite a lot as well. Uh, to be honest, Gang Gang. I hope everything's all right with you down there, darling. And Katie Hopkins, the great Susanna down there in Surrey somewhere. Uh, sending out a special love to you as well. I'm going to talk about it tonight and I'm going to talk a little bit about race and colour. Now, I don't do it often on this channel, uh, but I was thinking back earlier to the early days of black and white and then as years go by. Because in the early days, I have to, with what I saw, I can't speak for everybody else, but when I was growing up, it seemed to be you was either black, mixed race, as in half cast, black with a mixture of white, or white itself. Asians, Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis used to get a real, real rough time, right? I have to be honest. Uh, from the cooking of the food, uh, torturous times, uh, people used to run past your windows and smash them and knock down your doors and uh you know families had to go through very 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 difficult times uh when being asian wasn't so much easier as it is now now after all the years incarcerated over the years i've noticed a lot of change with cultural differences and eastern europeans uh more arabic asian communities of all sorts now, um, Saudi Arabians, Moroccans, uh, Somalians weren't around when we when I was younger, um, Bangladesh, Indian, Pakistanis, uh, Africans, West Indians. I can't, even way back in the day, right? Now there's a lot of more African, uh, more African countries around as well. But early on, in the 70s going into a bit the early 80s when i look about all my friends i can't see too many african descent by birth or by parentage were around much then i had a few that i knew i had quite a like a number like but not many like there is now so race has changed quite a lot uh, it's fair to say, and Asians now, uh, Asian origin, descent, if I can put this rightly, because you know I might not be the best at doing this, uh, seem to have grown more, if you like. Now they seem to be able to stick up for themselves more, where in the past, when I was younger, they had to run a lot, uh, seem to get picked on, bullied even. And that was bringing in, in the early days, owning the local corner shops, uh, bringing a lot of economy into the country regarding um, uh, food and business wise, that kind of stuff. They seem to have good heads uh, for building up businesses. So it's fair to say that they, you know, from day dot, as far as I can remember, um, held a strong position in our communities. Uh, with owning shops of all kinds, right? Now, with race, I noticed a lot of mistrust as well. So, white with black, because if we're talking in a criminal sense, white didn't trust black because black had a stereotype and stigma around the colour of fair to say, of committing of certain crimes. Like, even though we all know that it wasn't just black people that snatched 
handbags of ladies or other people. White people used to snatch handbags as well. But how do these things come out? They come out by statistics, by the police, uh, the old lady, sadly, being mugged down the street, was brought on by, you know, uh, uh, advertisements in the paper or headlines of black man uh, robs old white English lady. And, you know, I remember some tragic cases as well where uh, five men apparently grabbed a handbag of one lady and ended up dragging her along the floor and ended up dying. And it's things like this that lead to a lifetime of, you know, walking down the road of with a lady, a white English lady with her handbag and seeing a black man behind them holding onto it tighter. And then we used to think, you know, not me in particular, but the groups I was with hanging around at that time would think, oh, look, they're making us think that we're the, they've got to hold on to their handbags tighter because we're walking behind them. Uh, is it true? I believe it was. I believe some of it's true. Well, I do. Uh, but getting back to race in institutions, and um, it was very, very real then as well. So saying in the beginning of time when you did Borstal training and detention centre and YP and... Um, many, 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 many black men that first went to prison, uh, you know, would have gone through uh, that aspect of early institutional life. Because you'd always have, you know, not so much like scum, but fair to say Ray Winston played that part really well in scum because it was a bit like that. I'm the daddy of the wing kind of thing like you, you you always get a man coming through reception and you might straight away you might say something derogatory to a member of staff and uh if you was number one on the wing we talked about it the other day uh they say oh um you're number one of the wing your 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 job is to take charge of the house block you're on and make sure you keep it in order and if any bullying or you can take your little things and your perks of the job where you can tax or you can take your little bit or whatever, but you can also uh, beat him up as well, uh, a black man, because on the word of a prison officer who says, oh, he's a bit of a bully, he is. He, he's in for rape, he is. Uh, he's uh, in for handbag snatching he is and you know uh, weigh him in and beat him up how does all these things leave men in, in later life uh, with the system and with how they grew up and with uh, with what they saw in them early days of life I remember uh, one day right we was all on the pitch in Camp Hill right now there was a geezer called Sean McCarthy. Now, there was me, I think, Howard, Nookie, rest in peace, from Marsden, not really, not with us no more, and BG as well. And there was an, uh, a big geezer from Portsmouth called, like I said, Sean McCarthy, right? Now, the last thing we want uh, in jail is where there's a full-scale race riot because them kind of wars can lead on to other places and other places and other places and also uh, break up friendships as well. So you might have a white friend uh, and because of that day of him falling out with uh, uh, someone close to you, a black person or a white person, albeit what side, and because you've actually, you have to go with the colour, not saying you have to, but you know, that's part of the rules. If if you if it does happen, you have to go with the colour that you are, basically. So uh, you lose a friend. You lose a nice white friend or you lose a nice black friend because uh, now you're divided uh, by uh, the race wars, so to speak. So on this day, um, a tackle goes in, Right, Sean McCarthy, big, six foot five, 
One of those, there was another geezer from Portsmouth called Gary Saunders as well. <laughs> I don't know whether you've heard of him, right? But I think he'd done a documentary recently as well. But I remember him, right? But I'm not going to say too much on it, right? But I'm going to laugh. I'm going to laugh at a few things. I hope you get what I mean. But, right, listen, right? So we're on the football pitch and Sean McCarthy every week, sorry, I promise this geezer that I wouldn't be slurping no more from my cup. But I'm taking them tramadol again and it makes my mouth bloody dry, right? I hope that's not slurping. Every week without fail, he goes out there on the football pitch and it's more when you're getting your change when you're getting changed in the changing room, you're wondering who he's gonna start on today. Right now. I could almost guess in my mind who he had in mind, like, and I'll give him his due, uh, Sean McCarthy, he would have a row with anyone, right, but it always seemed that it would always be with a black person, so on this occasion, he chose BG, so the tackles come in, there was a geezer from uh, Peckham as well called Agus, Brilliant footballer as well, right? I remember he swung off. He swung off to Agus because Agus is really small, right? Uh, and he could like bob and weave, and Sean made himself look really silly. Or was it Gary Saunders? I can't remember which, but I remember um, Agus laughing at him. Uh, Barry, surname was, and I can remember him laughing at him because every punch he threw at him, he missed, and he was basically spinning round, making him look silly, and laughing at him as well, which was in turn making him really, really angry. But anyway. Uh, on this day, the fight starts. So they've got him for a tackle. BG's got the ball, right? Everyone's sitting about Sean as well, because this is happening too often. So they've got him for the tackle, and Sean straight away stuck the nut on him. Blood coming from down his head there. Um, BG's run straight into the gym and picked up a big 10 kilo weight and come charging outside. The gym screws didn't seem to care in Camp Hill for some reason. Uh, they used to want it to go on, if I'm fair to say it, if, if I can say it that way, if you get what I mean. But anyway, they let him travel all the way, they let him run all the way from the football pitch into the changing room, go and pick up a 10 kilo weight and come charging outside and swing it at Sean, right? And I can't remember whether he hit him or not. Well, it's, oh, I can't remember all the details, uh, but uh, I can remember that he landed something or another, right? So everyone started swinging on the football pitch. Oh, there was pushing and shoving and uh, you white this and you black that and da, da, da. And I was stuck right in the middle because I was hanging around more with black people at that time than I was with white. So I didn't really want to show myself out, so to speak. Like, uh, even though I'm white, I didn't want to be choosing one side over another in case they'll say, oh, you traitor, you're white and you're hanging around with a black, with black people, sorry to say, I nearly said it there. And then the black uh, community would say, oh, I thought you was with us, Yami. What are you doing with them white rednecks and blah, 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 blah. So... I didn't want to participate and I did well to keep out of it that day because I was thinking about the long-term repercussions uh, surrounding it all. Uh, but many times along my life, along them years, I struggled with that one because there was a time in the Cat A's when it kicked off as well. And uh, it was, there was a big time when it was a race war and it was all getting ready to kick off one day and the, and the all the Jamaicans were there at one time. And... Uh, I had Andy Shack Lady, Slaney, a few others as well were around. Um, we had Big Tone as well, but Tony was Tony was not partial to race nor you know some of the ones I talk about. They wouldn't. They're not racialists. They rather go with whoever's whoever their mate is, whether they're black or white. They don't choose colour, and they're not getting involved in no race war, right? So. All of a sudden now, they've involved me in the argument, right? So they're saying, uh, the Jamaicans are saying, no, 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 no. Yami B's not white. Yami B's black. Because we grow him since he 
was a little toddler. So he comes under black and he's part of our team, if you get what I mean. So I'm standing there looking all bewildered and lost and not really sure. And, you know, like the baby I was, not really uh, sure about what position to take. And, oh, I'm really looking to hide, really, and not really to turn up if it was going to kick off kind of thing, if you get what I mean. Um, uh, what happened now? Andy Shax was a was king for it. He was, he, 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 um, there's many like Andy as well. He's all right, Andy Shack. I, I got on well with him. Uh, I never met Sam Cole that many times, but he, he was, in in some respects, they used to say Sam Cole was the king of the Scousers, if you get what I mean. Uh, you know, when they have uh, their favourite Leeds man, and like it was Frank Burley, and their favourite uh, Birmingham man, I forgot who it was. I think they used to talk about someone called... Popeye was the early days of Birmingham. And then there was um, Marcus Darkus as well, later on, Birmingham, and then there was others and others. Anyway, Andy Shaq Andy used to always be fighting for that position with Sam Cole, I think, but he didn't have the character like Sam Cole. I never met Sam Cole, I only met him a couple of times, so I never really got to know him, but all the stories that came through, a uh, very charismatic man uh, on the information that's received over a number, a number of years, right? So he wasn't taking no sides either. It was either you as his mate or he wasn't. It didn't matter about colour. But um, they were all saying, nah, Yami is a white man and he is coming on the white side today. So the war was between seven and seven or seven and nine because uh, that's who the original arguments were with, right? Uh, so I didn't want no part in it, right? And many didn't play a part in it. So, but the ones that were calling my name had some kind of hold over me at that time. And we all know what that was, right? So my mind was thinking more about the job. And if I stayed with you on that day, uh, how many are you going to give me kind of thing? You know, I just say, well, shit with me, I know. Uh, but no, it worked itself out. But it wasn't the first time where I found myself in race wars. And it does happen a lot in there. And there's a lot of secret race wars in there as well, where on the one hand, uh, a man talks to like you're white and you talk to a lot of black people and yeah, mate, you get on well with them and all that. When your back's turned, they go, oh, black cunt, black cunt, black mug. Now, yeah, what's he doing with him? What does he mean? You know, but you weren't saying that to his face as well. Same with black uh, uh, personnel as well. You'll be talking to white people. This is what I noticed over a number of years as well, uh, being in those places. Like uh, you're talking to uh, white people on that day and yeah, you're getting on. Yeah, sweet mate, do you want a bit of this, bit of cake, bit of thing? Yeah, we all get on well, yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. And then they walk off and they say, you know, they don't really like us, don't you? And I say, what do you mean they don't really like you? He just gave you that. And he just said, so yeah, but just because they give you that and just because they do, it doesn't mean that they like you. It just means that they just want peace and quiet and they just don't want uh, to appear racialist. Because uh, being racialist and showing that you're racialist is two different things. Uh, you could be completely racialist and pretend not to be kind of thing. So I used to get it all the time. I heard many comments over the years from well-known faces as well, it's got to be said, where, you know, uh, you're talking to him one minute and then you're walking around, you're going like that, that kind of, on the way back. And then you're walking back on the side and the white person, uh, you no, know, what the black person's going, ah, he's a white racist, he is. You know, so many contradictory uh, things that I witnessed that in the end, I didn't know what to believe. Uh, but the one thing, well, I didn't know what to believe actually. And I believe there's an element of racialism in everything. And I ain't being funny. In later life, we are witnessed in the early days of my life, a lot of um, bullying with Asians, you know, who fair to say uh, in the beginning of time had the rough end of the stick if you like. We used to have this thing when they were younger, they used to call it uh, not being rude or anything, they used to call it packy bashing and you know, or Asian bashing and you know, um, always burgle 
Asian people's houses because you get better jewelry or, you know, there was all these things, uh, stigmas and stereotypes surrounding uh, different races for different things from the beginning of time. And I started to see uh, a lot of, not saying uh, regularly or consistently, sorry, not saying differently, right? But, sorry, sorry, sorry. But, I think in later life, some Asians took revenge uh, for the treatment of their ancestors or their grown-ups when they hear the stories from their grandfathers or their aunties or their uncles and the treatment that they used to get. And I, I find in later, like saying like, when uh, the situation changed in the Ka'as where, you know, um, the rules changed, the old guard changed. You know, someone was asking me the other day, Yami, why don't you talk about the religious wars inside there and the color wars? Because uh, you saw a lot of it and you witnessed a lot of white men or even black men being violated or absolutely horrendously violated by men of Arabic or Asian descent. So is there anything in that? Or was it just a religious thing uh, that you joined? Because I also noticed, and I, I, I'm not saying that's with all uh all, rela all, all race uh, stuff or colours, right? I'm talking about isolated incidents here. But I can remember, like, when it was prayer time and Muslim men, because remember, I, I, I converted as well and I learned a bit about the Quran and I learned a few surahs as well uh, that I can read off to you if you ask me. I think I know about five, six or seven uh, surahs as we call them, right? And I used to get um, paid in uh, by the big man uh, who, who used to give you rewards for learning prayers and things like that. Very nice, nice gentleman uh, who teach you the right way, is so to speak, if you get what I mean. Uh, but imagine everybody's converting at this time. I believe a lot of it is for protection because it's not so much about the old English gentleman like, uh, what's his name from back in the day, uh, when there's big trouble on the wing and, right, I wanna go and see Big Tell down there or Robert down there or Kenny down there. Let him see, let's see what he says and what he says go. No, the rules changed in the K's in later life. It became about, it became about uh, the old Muslim man with the beard and that, and with, with, with the, with the, uh, beard, as in a Muslim beard, who had the final say on whether violence could take place. Now, uh, I can remember, say, uh, a war about to take place where a man has converted to being Muslim and some of the brothers are saying, no, nah, no, nah, that's not right. Is that you still, Robert Simmons, TJ? You're after me. I'm coming for you tonight. I'm not, not coming for you, but I'm going to call you in a bit, TJ. Trace the face. I love you. Um, I'm, so, 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 listen to this one, right? So, they're saying, um, oh, what was it again? Oh, bloody hell, man. He said, oh, there's a war going to start tonight. Uh, and no, they've converted, but the brothers are saying to the big, the top man, if you like, no, they've only converted for protection so that uh, they can get an easy ride because they know we're running the place now and it's not they're not really into the Quran. They're not really here because they believe in Allah and that kind of stuff. I mean, who are you to judge? No one knows what a man's going through really deep down inside of him. You can never be too sure. Uh, I refuse to make judgments like that because uh, I've been surprised too many times. Uh, and the big man will say no. He's Muslim, full stop. No, you cannot touch him uh, because he is. He took his shahada and he's Muslim. I don't care what you say, you're to leave him alone. And he'll walk off, look like they're sulking. But then on the other hand, right? 
get on things like this now. You know, like, duty. Praying five times a day. Uh, um, two o'clock in the afternoon and then just before bang up. And it's a brother's duty. Uh, sometimes six, seven men in a cell crammed up, getting ready to pray. And uh, someone say to me, Yami, go and call all the rest of them and tell them it's prayer time and blah, 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 blah. And I used to think, oh, watch, look. I know when I go upstairs, they're not going to say, oh, Yami, don't call me for no prayer time and blah, blah, blah. But, oh, but hold on, you're, you've converted. You've said that you're a Muslim now and you're you're agreeing to, yeah, but, you know, it's not every day that a man can pray on time kind of thing. He might have to rush around and get his dinner done or whatever, but whatever, right? So... These are the kind of things that took place in the cat A's and I used to lie on my bed and I used to laugh because uh, if it was because of, I go there and I say, yeah, uh, uh, Ibrahim, Ibrahim, deep, deep man, rest in peace now, good, good man as well. He had five months left of a sentence, right? And he ended up getting lifed off, for apparently, allegedly killing a man in Rye Hill. Uh, and he got, uh, he got, he was doing a long sentence and he only had a couple of months left. He got lifed off. So when I saw him, he was on his last lap. He used to say, I'm on my last lap, yummy. I'm waiting to go to paradise. I'm praying. He used to pray, pray, pray Salah every single day. You know, a man who does without his TV, who does it properly in the way that they're meant to do it. And the, you know, the religion is very, very strict. Uh, and it takes some man and it takes some doing to keep to, you know, uh, a consistent level of, you know, um, uh, staying in front or staying consistently following what the Quran says or asks of you, because there's a lot of sacrifices. So then turning up one day, if this don't sum it all up, I turned up one day and I said, yo, da 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 yeah, it's prayer time. And through the, through, 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 when I was walking off, walking, all, all I could hear was uh, teeth being kissed, like, and that kind of stuff. And I said, what's wrong? I said, I'm not having no Asian man telling me when to pray and when not to pray. Or, uh, or, or well, I'm not being bullied into, but hold on, you're not being bullied into doing anything. You converted and they're just doing their duty by telling you out of kindness that it's prayer time. And that they, just in case you forgot, you know, Salah is a obligatory and you know you've got to do your the wudu and all that before you do your prayer so they like you to get prepared to do so basically they're doing it out of the kindness of their heart they're not doing it because they're bullying you into you know joining some kind of cult you know it's part part and parcel of the religion for your fellow brother to come and warn you or tell you that it's um prayer time and you're going to tell me that you're still going to turn up to go and pray when you're saying all what you're saying are being bullied. I ain't listening and you're kissing your teeth, but you still end up in the same room as the brothers that have asked you to come and pray. But 10 minutes before that, you were saying, oh, I ain't, I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, because all your, you know, that, that kind of, I'm not turning. So then... That makes you look like you are being forced to do or get go do something against your will, in my reckoning. Because on the one hand, you're telling me I'm not being told what to do by way of like, when I should pray or when I should not, not pray, because it's their duty to come and tell you what time, because it says there's a, 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 a time board that tells you when you got to pray Fajr uh, and all the, all the different prayers and times you got to pray. Uh, the times are there. So by saying what you're saying, you're belittling and disrespecting yourself because you're still turning up there. That means that you're praying because you're, you you are showing yourself out to be in it for the wrong reasons, that you're basically converting just so that, you know, you're, it can be seen because 
a lot of that time as well, it's fair to say, a lot of men had beef with this man and that man and that man. And if you didn't convert and you wasn't a Muslim and your enemy dropped in, you'd have about 600 uh, of your religious mates with your Muslim being at that time who were going to say, what, is he a Muslim? No, he's not. All right, we'll back you on that, brother, because you're with us and that. And then some of those brothers sincerely mean it, that if you're with us, uh, we're with you, but some are mis mistreating it uh, in a bad, bad way and using it to their advantage uh, so that they can get the winning hand over their enemies. So how does that make you feel? that you're turning up into a room to pray when you've already said that you're not being told what to do by an Asian man or a black man or a white man or whatever, you know? There were times when I was with three or four men in Long Larton and apparently when they went to Franklin uh, uh, after spending two or three years with the brothers, when they got to Franklin, I heard that they took their gowns off and they weren't Muslim no more. That they were hanging around with the same people that uh, were at war with the brothers at that time. I couldn't take it serious then. If you're going to go through all that for three, four years for protection and survival at that time, you're just doing it as a survival trick so that you can get by at that time. By the minute that everybody else is not there, you're turning back into who you originally was before you converted and changed, took your shahada into, you know, changing your whole life with becoming a Muslim, because it's a big, big change to take that you can just go down the road to another prison and turn into what you was before and all that went before you. Think about all, all think about all what them brothers think about you then. Ah, oh, that's too long, I've been talking, sorry. Uh, but those, that's what, the, that's what the cat A's are like. If some of you don't know, uh, think about that. Think about the shame of that, that you're turning up and do, going against your own free will, but you're coming out here telling everyone that you settled on by, uh, that it was easy for you in there, and that you sell through the cat A's, and, it, and uh, it was an easy walk in the park for you, when really you wasn't. It was very, very difficult for you, because anything you have to do against your own free will, where it ain't the screws or it ain't authority telling you what to do, it's your fellow man, uh, means to me that you struggle to do your sentence. So uh, maybe I'll be up late, I'm still quite early. Love it, love it.